Hi, and welcome to Crash Course Catholicism, a podcast about Catholic teaching and why it makes sense. I'm your host, Caitlin West. Alrighty, so this episode is on the Holy Spirit. Okay, now, I don't know about you, but personally, I kind of find that of the three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the person that I kind of have the hardest time connecting with, right, or sort of relating to. And I guess when you think about it, it makes sense. Like, if I say God the Father, well, I have a father, right? Most of us have some sort of father figure in our lives, or we've seen father figures, and so we know what that relationship looks like. So even if I don't have like a clear picture in my head of what God the Father looks like, even if to some extent he's a mystery to me, I still know how I should relate to him. And then when it comes to God the Son, well, okay, that's even easier because God the Son actually became a human being. So all I need to do is like read the Gospels or, you know, watch The Chosen, and suddenly I've got this instant sort of visual image of this human being who has like a face and a voice and I can look at him and laugh with him and speak to him. And then we come to the Holy Spirit and the whole thing kind of like grinds to a screeching halt. (laughs) We're sort of like, ah, okay, so he's a spirit. (laughs) Like, what do I do with that, you know? And then we think about like the ways that we portray the Holy Spirit, like as a tongue of fire or as a dove, you know, and we're sort of like, well, I don't know how to talk to a tongue of fire, you know, how do I relate to a dove? (laughs) And it can kind of feel sort of abstract. And because it feels abstract and sort of intangible, we can fall into the trap of kind of putting the Holy Spirit aside a bit and treating him almost like he's like an accessory or a sort of optional addendum to God, right? Or, you know, maybe we don't forget about him completely, but maybe we think about the Holy Spirit and talk about the Holy Spirit almost like he's this kind of impersonal sort of force of energy, you know, like the force in Star Wars or like electricity, you know, like powerful and real, but not alive or personal. And I think what sort of lies at the heart of this difficulty with the Holy Spirit is an imperfect understanding of who he is and what his function is. And once we understand those things, the Holy Holy Spirit becomes so much easier to actually relate to. So that's what we're going to do in this episode. We're going to think about who the Holy Spirit actually is and how he operates in our lives and in the life of the church. So I guess the best place to start is with the kind of obvious basic information, right? Like what do we actually know about the Holy Spirit? Well, we know that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. And we say in the creed that he proceeds from the Father and the Son. So we talk about him being the love between the Father and the Son. So Fulton Sheen describes the Holy Spirit as the sigh of love between the Father and the Son. And this is something that the Catechism picks up on as well in point number 691. It talks about how the word spirit is actually a translation of a Hebrew word which means breath or air or wind. So there's this idea that the Holy Spirit is this kind of sigh of love. He's the breath of God. And that can be a helpful image because it means makes the idea of the Holy Spirit more tangible. But it is an image that needs to be kind of elaborated on because while it can be helpful, it can also give us a bit of a bum steer. So when I, as a human being, when I love someone else, I am a person and the other person is a person, but my love is inanimate right? It's it's a what, it's not a who. Okay, so like when I sigh with love for Tom Hiddleston, right, that sigh is not alive. Now, when it comes to God, this is not the case. And in fact, this is the only instance in which this is not the case. The love between the Father and the Son is so utterly complete that it is love itself. Okay, in other words, God's love is God. God himself. And this is something that we talked about in the episode on the Trinity. So what this means is that God's love, that sigh of love, is 
alive, right? And not just alive, it is life itself. It is living. So when we say that the Holy Spirit is a person, this is what we mean. He's not just an inanimate force, right? Or an abstract idea. He is a person who is alive. Now, what does this mean, right? For us to say that the Holy Spirit is a person. What does it mean for us? Well, what it means is that he is personal, right? Like we can relate to him just like we relate to the persons of the Father and the Son. But, and this is really important, although the Holy Spirit is a person, he is not a human person, okay? He's not a human being. And you know, I think often because we're, we are human beings and we want to make God tangible and accessible, we tend to try to kind of anthropomorphize God. Like we, we try to give him purely human attributes because that makes him more tangible and more real to us. And that is fair enough, right? That's okay. And it's one of the reasons, in fact, why God the Son became a human being, because he gets that and he wants us to be able to interact with him in that kind of tangible, face-to-face human way. So that's not a bad instinct, but... But it can get in the way when we try to apply it to our interactions with the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit does not interact with us or engage with us or communicate with us in the same way that we communicate with other human beings. So, okay, think about it. Think about how you communicate with other humans. Well, we usually use language. You will speak directly to that person and then that person will speak directly back to you. Okay. Or maybe you're speaking over the phone or in writing or whatever, but there's this kind of direct language-based communication. And we said before that Jesus' humanity makes him really easy to talk to. So this is probably one of the things that you will do when you talk to Jesus, right? You know, we sort of sit down and look at him in our mind's eye and we chat to him like we chat to our best friend. And that's great. But when we try to do that with the Holy Spirit, it's kind of like trying to catch soap in the bath, right? Like it just doesn't work. And well, the catechism offers us an idea that can provide a bit of illumination here. So point number 687 reads, the Spirit Spirit makes us hear the Father's word, but we do not hear the Spirit himself. We know him only in the movement by which he reveals the word to us. Those who believe in Christ know the Spirit because he dwells with them. Okay, now let's sit with this point for a bit. Basically, what it's telling us is that the Spirit doesn't speak. Okay, he moves. He moves within us and he moves us, right? The Holy Spirit dwells in us and he moves our hearts and minds. And in so doing, he reveals the word to us. He reveals Christ and Christ in turn reveals the Father. So in point number 683 of the Catechism, it says, The Holy Spirit comes to meet us and communicates to us the life that originates in the Father and is offered to us in the Son. So the image that comes to mind here is of like a little kid. You know, if you've ever interacted with a little kid who's like too young to talk, right? They don't communicate using language yet, but they want to play with you and they want to show you something or they want to take you somewhere. So they come up to you and then they take you by the hand and they lead you where they want you to go, right? Or maybe they bring something to you and they show it to you you. So they communicate through movement rather than through language. Now, this can be a source of frustration sometimes when we pray, right? Because sometimes we sit down to pray and we want our dialogue with the Holy Spirit to be like a conversation that we would have with any other human being, right? So we sit down and we say, okay, Holy Spirit, this is what I'm thinking at the moment, or I'm not sure what to do about this, or this is what's on my mind. What do you think? And then we'll just sort of sit there waiting for an answer and we're sort of expecting the Holy Spirit to be like, well, Caitlin, this is what I think of your problem. You should blah, blah, blah. And of course, you know, sometimes we do get a pretty clear sort of sense of what God is trying to say to us when we pray. Or maybe it's a bit more abstract, maybe like a a line from something we've read might pop into our heads or something from the gospel of the day or whatever might occur to us. But more often than not, the Holy Spirit doesn't speak to us in words 
but rather he moves us towards the good. He reveals the truth to us in ways that might be more subtle, but are deeper and more profound, right? So when we pray to the Holy Spirit, we need to have patience that he's not just going to reply to us, you know, conversationally. Maybe it'll take days or weeks, or maybe a friend will say something to us later, or we'll read something later that day, or something might pop into our heads later on. You know, that's the way that the Holy Spirit communicates with us. So in Romans 8.26, it says, We do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. So that's how the Spirit speaks, right? He sighs, and that sigh moves us towards the Son and then in turn towards the Father. But the thing to bear in mind is that the Holy Spirit always responds to our prayers when we pray. It's just that he might not respond in the way that we are expecting him to because he's not a human being and we're not sitting and talking to a human being. Now, if we return to that image of a child kind of taking us by the hand and leading us somewhere, that image is helpful, but it can also be a little bit misleading because the Holy Spirit isn't someone that is external to us, this external force that's tugging us along. Rather, if we're in the state of grace, the Holy Spirit dwells within us, right? He's like he's like blood pumping through our spiritual veins, except that the difference is that this blood is alive, right? It is the living, divine life of God flowing through us. So point number 735 of the Catechism says that the Holy Spirit gives us the very life of the Holy Trinity. And this life is what brings us to life. This is is what makes it possible for us to be holy. So without the divine life of the Holy Trinity flowing through our veins, we cannot possibly become holy. So there's this book by Jacques Philippe called In the School of the Holy Spirit. I really recommend you read it if you haven't already because it's just absolutely fantastic. But he begins this book by pointing out the fact that people tend to think that holiness is the work of human beings, right? Like it's kind of our job. There's a certain, you know, set of tasks that we have to carry out and all we have to do is just carry them out, like going down a list and ticking off all the things on the list. And when we get to the bottom, we'll be holy. It's kind of like if you were lifting weights, right? You just have to add a little bit more weight every time. And eventually, if you keep going, you'll look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? But Jacques Philippe goes on to say that actually it is impossible for us to attain holiness by our own power. It doesn't matter how much good we do, doesn't matter like, you know, how incredible we are, if we don't have that spark of divine life in us, we're basically spiritually dead. Yeah, we can't achieve anything. So it's kind of like like a marionette, right? If you pick up a puppet and you use the strings to move its arms and legs, that doesn't mean that the puppet is alive. It doesn't matter how convincingly you're making it sort of dance around. It is not alive. And it's exactly the same with us. Without the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter how much we're dancing around. If we don't have that spark of life in us, holiness is impossible. And even once we do have that spark of divine life within us, it's not just a matter of like, okay, yep, great. Okay, thanks. Cheers, Holy Spirit, for giving me that kickstart. Now I'm spiritually alive. And from now on, it's all up to me, right? It, like the Holy Spirit is the petrol that's giving me a kickstart, but I'm the one who's driving the car. No. <laughs> okay. We are never driving the car. That's, that's not our job. We are called at all times to let the Holy Spirit guide and direct everything we do. So if you remember earlier, we said that the Holy Spirit isn't just an inanimate force, right? It is the living God living within us. So our job as Christians is just to let God live more and more fully within us. So in Galatians 2.20, St. Paul says, It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Now, that is not just like a turn of phrase, right? That is an expression. That's a perfect expression of our Christian vocation. This is what we are called to. As John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease. So ultimately, as Christians, we've just got one job, right? Our, we, we don't have to run around like a headless chook kind of doing a million good things. We've got one job. That job is just to be docile to the Holy Spirit, right? That's it. Just empty ourselves and let the divine life of God fill us and act through us more and more. So St. Faustina sums this up when she says that the shortest road to holiness 
is faithfulness to the inspirations of the Holy Spirit, just being docile to him. So, okay, maybe you hear all of this and you might be sort of thinking, okay, well, it sounds like you're saying that in order to be holy, I don't really have to do anything, right? Like all I have to do is be completely passive and just let the Holy Spirit move through me, right? So I'm having like a vision of, of you know, of us all lying on our couches doing nothing for the rest of our lives. And then if anyone questions us, we're just like, hey, no, man, I'm just letting the divine life of the Holy Spirit flow through me unimpeded. Okay, no, <laughs> that is not what we're called to do. Please don't do that. As Christians, of course, we are meant to do good things, But the point is that we are not the instigators. We're not the ones driving the car. We need to be guided and propelled at all times, constantly, by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so so what does that actually look like? How do we be docile to the Holy Spirit? Because that sounds a little bit abstract. Okay, well, actually, Pope Francis was talking about this just recently in one of his Wednesday audiences. He was saying that one really important thing for us to do is just to continually invite the Holy Spirit into our lives, right? And he says, like, like literally throughout the day, just repeat the aspiration, come Holy Spirit. And, you know, it might not always be that explicit, But maybe, you know, it's just a matter of us pausing throughout our day before we make a decision or just as we go about our day and leaving space to invite the Holy Spirit to move in us however he might need to, right? Trying to create times of quiet during our day where we switch off, you know, music and social media and we can sort of turn down all of the white noise and just create space for the Holy Spirit to to prompt us. And okay, so you might be hearing this and sort of thinking, okay, but then how do we know that it's the Holy Spirit, right? How do we know this is the voice of the Holy Spirit and not just, you know, my imagination? Okay, well, two quick things. First of all, as we get to know someone better, we get better at recognizing their voice. Okay, so this is something that takes prayer and it takes time and it takes, as we were just saying, like creating space for the Holy Spirit. Secondly, we can go back here to the image of a walled garden, right? Like if we know where the walls are, in other words, if we know our faith well, if we're well formed, we're going to be less worried about wandering off into unmarked territory. But if you want to think more about this, about how to talk to the Holy Spirit and how to recognize that it's the Holy Spirit speaking to you, we don't have time to go into it in depth here, but I would really recommend, again, reading in the School of the Holy Spirit, because Jacques Philippe talks a lot about this um, and very wisely and clearly. But basically, in a nutshell, what we're called to do is to get better and better at recognizing the voice of the Holy Spirit and letting him take the wheel, right? Saying yes when we feel him prompting us to do something. And some Sometimes that saying yes, that could be really hard, right? And in those moments, that's when we are called to rely even more on the Holy Spirit. So it's like, you know, in the morning when your alarm goes off and you wake up and you know that the Holy Spirit is prompting you to get out of bed, but you just can't do it because you're so tired, right? That is the moment where we then again turn to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, please, I'm so weak. I want to get out of bed. I want to say yes to you. Help me. Help me to say yes to you. And this is where we kind of circle back to that idea that the Holy Spirit isn't just an addendum, right, or an optional extra when it comes to our relationship with God. In fact, the opposite is true. The Holy Spirit is like the fundamental thing that we rely on for our holiness. The Holy Spirit is to our spiritual life what oxygen is to our bodies, right, or the blood in our veins, St. Augustine writes that the Holy Spirit alone distinguishes the sons of the eternal kingdom and the sons of eternal perdition. So think about that. He says the Holy Spirit alone distinguishes between the saved and not saved. Okay, not as an optional extra after we've done all of the good stuff. Without the Holy Spirit, we can do nothing. Now, once we understand all of this, once we know on a kind of fundamental level who the Holy Spirit is and what his role is, We can then return to some of those images that we mentioned at the beginning of the episode, like the dove and fire and water, because we can see that, you know, none of these images is trying to capture the fullness of the Holy Spirit, but each of them illuminates something really important and different about the Holy Spirit. So the catechism from point 692 to 701 goes through a whole list of images and symbols and titles that we use to describe the Holy Spirit. 
So it points out that the first time that Jesus promises the Holy Spirit to us, right, he refers to the Holy Spirit as the paraclete. And the Catechism tells us that this word paraclete literally means he who is called to one side. Okay, and it goes on to say that the word paraclete is commonly translated as the consoler. Okay, so we're reminded here that the Holy Spirit has been sent to stay by our side and to console us, right? And that he is always, 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 always with us. As long as we don't reject him, then he is not going anywhere. And this can be such a great consolation, you know, especially in periods of suffering or loneliness or distress, that even if we can't feel him, the Holy Spirit is by our side. He's closer than we can ever imagine. And that truth is contained even in his name, right? So uh, there's a song, there are two songs actually, one by a French singer called Karen Ann, it's called Not Going Anywhere, and the other one is by the Velvet Underground and it's called I'm Sticking With You. Both of these songs, they always make me think of the Holy Spirit, right? And of this fact that if we don't abandon God, he's not going to abandon us, you know? And sometimes, you know, you get a song like that stuck in your head and that can become a form of prayer, right? We can pray about the fact that if we don't abandon God, he's not going to abandon us. Okay, so some other symbols that we use for the Holy Spirit are water and oil. So we use these in the sacraments as a way of signifying the presence and the action of the Holy Spirit. And this is something that we'll talk about more when we talk about the sacraments, but basically because we're human, we need tangible things, right, that remind us that God is present and that his spirit is active. So this is why we baptize people with water and we anoint them with oil. And both of these symbols are really powerful because Water reminds us that with the Holy Spirit, we are cleansed of our sins. Okay, we are washed clean. And then the oil reminds us that we are anointed. In other words, we are claimed as gods and sent out on a mission. Like in the words of the Blues Brothers, we're on a mission from God. We aren't just baptized, we are anointed. And our mission is to share the Holy Spirit with others. And this leads us to the next symbol, which is fire. So here we can think of the tongues of fire at Pentecost. Now, the Catechism says that fire symbolizes the transforming energy of the Holy Spirit's actions. So, you know, if you look at an illustration of Pentecost, often the tongues of fire, they're depicted as these very discreet little sort of like candle flames, like hovering above the heads of the disciples. That is not how I picture those flames, right? I mean, think about what a fire is like. If you've ever stood at a campfire and you've seen that moment where a flame kind of leaps out from the fire, it's always a bit scary, right? It's like, whoa, you have this moment of realizing that it would be so easy for that flame to catch on to something and to just consume it so quickly, right? There is so much energy and power and kind of passion to fire. Fire isn't neat and tame. It is powerful. It, it has the capacity to utterly possess and transform things and also to spread, right? So as Christians, we are called to burn with the fire of the Holy Spirit and then to share it with others. So another image that we see a lot, especially in the Old Testament, but also in the New, is the image of cloud and light. And often these two things appear together, a cloud and light, when the Holy Spirit is active. So we can think, for instance, of the transfiguration on Mount Tabor, just before the crucifixion, where Jesus is completely transfigured and becomes completely illuminated. And at the same time, a cloud overshadows him and the apostles and a voice comes from the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. So this is really interesting. The presence of both cloud and light. It reminds us that while we're alive on this earth, there will always be a mix of both mystery and illumination, right? Because we're not in heaven. We don't see God face to face. And this can be really helpful for us to remember that the Holy Spirit will illuminate the things that we need to understand, but he will not illuminate everything. Some things will remain obscure, but that's okay because things that need to be illuminated will be. Okay, and then the final image is the image of a dove. Now, this is an image that has kind of become a bit of like a, like a tame hippie symbol, right? And it might strike us as something a bit lame. <laughs> okay, but, but let's just think about what it actually means and what it meant, especially to the earliest Christians. So in the Song of Songs in the Old Testament, 
A dove is used to symbolize the beloved. Okay, and commentators have seen it as a symbol of the church. And both St. Cyprian and St. Augustine, who were early church fathers in the first few centuries, they both talk about how the dove symbolizes the church, and not just the church, but the church unified and at peace. So we can think about how a dove appears holding an olive branch after the great flood to signify this kind of return to stability and peace and safety, right? So the dove is a symbol of the peace and unity that the Holy Spirit brings to the church. And this is a really important idea for us to remember, particularly today when we see this kind of growing tendency within the church to sort of divide into factions, you know, to sort of be like, well, I'm this type of Catholic and you're that type of Catholic and this type of Catholic is better than that type or, you know, I do things my way and it's better than your way, whatever it is. In reality, we have all been baptized by the same spirit into the same church. Yeah, And of course, we all have a different spirit. We have different ways of living our faith and we all have different gifts. And there are infinite ways of living out our faith within the context of, you know, Orthodox Catholicism. But we have to be unified. We're a family, right? A house divided against itself cannot stand. We know that. And it's the Holy Spirit who is love itself, who will help to maintain that unity and peace. So when we see that in the church or in ourselves, that tendency to kind of alienate ourselves from other people within the church, we can go to the Holy Spirit and pray for that unity. And if this is something that you want to pray about more or you want to think about more, I would really recommend reading chapter 12 of the first letter to the Corinthians, because St. Paul talks a lot about unity and division in that chapter. It's really beautiful. Okay, so those are some of the images that the church uses to symbolize who the Holy Spirit is. And we can pray about each of them and each of them will sort of teach us something about the Holy Spirit and how he operates in our own lives. Now, when we read the Bible, we might think of the Holy Spirit mostly making an appearance in the New Testament, yeah, particularly after the resurrection from Pentecost onward. But the Catechism reminds us that actually the Holy Spirit is at work throughout all of salvation history from the very beginning, even if he isn't fully revealed until after the resurrection of Christ. So, for instance, we can think about how in the very first chapters of Genesis, we read that the Lord God formed man and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So returning here to this idea of the Holy Spirit as the breath of God. God doesn't just breathe physical life into Adam, but also the life of the Holy Spirit. And this is the life that is lost when sin enters the world. So from that point onwards, throughout the Old Testament, you know, the Holy Spirit is still at work, but he's not active in the world in the same way. And when we read the Old Testament, we often just focus on the coming of the Messiah, right? The coming of Christ. But one of the things that we might overlook is the role of the Holy Spirit in the mission of Christ. The world was promised a Messiah who had been anointed by the Holy Spirit, and that is really important. So point number 727 of the Catechism reads, The Son is anointed by the Father's Spirit since his incarnation, and Christ's whole work is in fact a joint mission of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Okay, so let's unpack that quote. Basically, what it's saying is that the mission of Christ is intimately and inextricably bound up in the mission of the Holy Spirit. The whole point of Christ's incarnation, right, of him becoming a human being, isn't just for him to die and rise again and save us from our sin. It is also for him to leave the Holy Spirit with us. So Fulton Sheen puts it this way. I find this really powerful and I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but basically what he says is that in the person of Jesus, in his life and death and resurrection, we see someone we can imitate. But in the Holy Spirit, we are given a life to be lived. 
So by sending the Holy Spirit, God allows his divine life, the divine life of Christ to live in us, right? We're not just trying to be like Christ who is external to us. We can actually truly become another Christ. Again, that's not just a turn of phrase. We can, if we empty ourselves and allow the Holy Spirit to move in us, then we can become truly another Christ. And this is the mission of the Holy Spirit in this kind of final era is to draw all people to the Father through the Son. So point number 686 of the Catechism says, in these end times, the Spirit is revealed as a person. Now can this divine plan be embodied in mankind by the outpouring of the Spirit as the church the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. So, you know, we said in the last episode that this kind of final era is like the era of the Antichrist. It is also the era of the Holy Spirit, right? This is the time of the Holy Spirit, and he will spend the rest of time through the church through tradition, through the magisterium, through the sacraments, through prayer, and through the witness of the saints, he will draw all things to the Father. Okay, and these are ideas that we're going to continue talking about in the next few episodes. We're going to talk about the life of the church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and life everlasting. Okay, well, that is where I'm going to leave it for today. Thank you for sticking with me. Our next episode is on the Catholic Church, part one. I can't wait. Have a great fortnight and I will see you soon. Bye.